This is Leisha Holmes and I'm your host on the Recruiters Recruitment Podcast and I'm absolutely in awe today to be honest with you because my next guest on the podcast is somebody that I've been listening to on his podcast and been following for a number of years having come across him on a diary of a CEO with Stephen Bartlett and listening to his own podcast I'm now a super fan eat sleep work repeat this is Bruce Daisley who I'd like to say is a bit of an evangelist when it comes to workplace culture and talking about how we should be working in the modern world so welcome to you today Bruce how are you I'm good thank you how are you I'm all right thank you I hope that intro was okay I am a little bit of a fan a bit of a fan so I'm having to kind of calm myself down a little bit but thank you for joining us today so there might be people listening because we have got a global audience who are not yet familiar with who you are what your podcast is about so would you like to give a much better synopsis of what you actually do and anyone mentions that diary of a CEO uh, mm-hmm. interview to me, I uh, I remember vividly what happened, and it was in the midst of of one of the extremes of COVID, um, where I don't think you were really even meant to leave your house unless it was work related, extremely work related. Mm-hmm. And he said we record record in person, and it is exempt for that. And uh, anyway, I set off, <laughs> and uh, I left my house, and every shop in London is closed where I live, and. Uh, and I set off and I'm like halfway there. And I, I like getting to places on, you know, 10 minutes early, but like uh, I'm halfway there and I realized oh, it's a video interview as well. Anyway, let me tell you, I look like uh, I turn up there. I look like I'm wearing a, a Greta Thunberg t-shirt, some sort of sports hoodie. <laughs> I look like it's laundry day. That's the only way to describe it. It's laundry day, which is unfortunate because I can be well presented in real life. But um, anyway, so. It's when anyone ever mentions that, I think, oh god. Oh goodness. no! It's anyway, like because... it's like when you see an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend in the supermarket, and you haven't got any makeup on, you've got your tracky on, and then you realise that's how you look. It's a similar kind of mental. Oh, absolutely. The, mecha- the mechanics of just thinking <laughs> on my. I always used to think about Wimbledon. You know, I always used to think I just want it to be sunny for those two weeks because when Americans <laughs> are turning on the telly, when Spanish people are. are basking in their glorious sunshine <laughs> and they turn on the telly and they go oh it's quite pretty nice in britain that's yeah. all i want i just I want like to, to put on your best display <laughs> of course I, you for, do. A long, for a long time i worked in uh, technology companies i worked at google i set up youtube in the uk for google i um then i went to twitter i worked for eight years as a senior leader ultimately across europe middle east and africa and, and during that time i became obsessed with workplace culture I was always fascinated with it the mechanics of your favorite job that favorite team that you were ever in why that team felt different to this team why your team in the same company felt different to that team across the floor where everyone seemed to spend their time crying and so yeah I was always struck by like the 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 elements that forge that and you know actually Mm. recruitment it's about trying to bring those right pieces together. It's about sort of being the the conductor of that to some extent, right? And the, finding yeah. the right roles. Um, anyway, so I do a podcast on workplace culture and, you know, and ultimately sort of how to enjoy our work more. And not because like I'm like an agent for the bosses trying to, you know, tell you that you need to enjoy work. You better love this work. Mm. But more because if you're going to spend 40 hours a week doing something, it's a way better to, way to spend spend a lifetime with a smile on your face than than sort of feeling wretched and isolated and lonely anyway oh. and I've um so that I, I did uh I do a podcast on that I did a book on that called The Joy of Work and I've just this year had a new book it's just uh this week a Sunday Times bestseller uh top five in the Sunday Times bestsellers and that's called Fortitude and it's about the the myth of resilience and what we get wrong about resilience we're going to come on to that. And I have actually, again, super fun. I have brought one with me for anyone watching on YouTube. Congratulations on the Sunday Times. And it's having only got managed to get through a few chapters before we recorded this. It's superbly written and really enjoyable. Um, I want to pick up on a really important word there, actually, because we're coming at this, although from different aspects for the same purpose which is about creating joy in what we do and not many people have talked about that I think it's always been seen as a bit of a I don't know flaky thing to say so I'm really delighted that you're coming at it from the same point because I think everyone listening to this is going to be associated in some way to recruitment across the world whether it's as a an industry leader in-house for a natural brand maybe like Twitter or for as a recruiter starting out their journey. We are conduits. We are here to, you know, ensure that the people that we place and the people that we hire are part of 
of our culture. So I think it's a really great starting point. So it is around workplace culture. That's what you are seen as the expert voice in and, and the enthusiast. I love that word. So one big topic that's been sort of talked about really since COVID began is whether or not and I have listened to one of your podcasts on this, but I'm not going to lead you on it, whether we should be encouraging a hybrid culture, because it's the biggest talked about topic in recruitment, Bruce, let me tell you, should we be going hybrid? Should we be getting people back in the office? Should we be forcing it? So how would you position that in our industry? Yeah, I, I, feel, I feel that this is, um, a re- I, I love the reversal of fortune that's happened here. So anyone who's worked with senior management leadership, you know, what's sometimes called the C-suite over the last few years. They've, um, the the magazines, the courses that they've sent themselves on, they've they've all said this mantra to themselves that, you know, the only constant is change. And, you know, our teams need to get rid of change. There's been <laughs> funny books uh, written on this. Bestsellers. Uh, I love I love all, the whole mechanic of this. There was a book called Who Moved My Cheese? That read was, it. Um, I've read it. This, well, it was this p- parable that bosses used to buy for their teams. And the reason why that book sold immense amounts. In fact, this week, it probably st- still sold enough to get into the bestsellers. And uh, it, and it's effectively, bosses used to drop it on their teams. And it'd be like, yeah, you're moaning that we've had a restructure. Well, you better get used to it because the mouse who gets the cheese is the mouse who learns that the cheese has moved. Right. That's it. They've mm. preached to everyone. You better get used to change. Here's what's happened in the last two and a half years. The world has changed. And the only people who are really crying about it are the people who bought these passive aggressive ESOP fables and handed them. T- and so managers across the world are work like, well, this isn't working. And I kind of think we need to get everyone back to the office right now. And I just love the reverse. I love it. I love the irony that mm. it's the people who were telling us that we needed to accept that there was no security anymore, that, that things are going to change. And in fact, What's happened in the last two and a half years is workers have gone, this is good, isn't it? This I actually, I quite like seeing my family occasionally. I quite like not taking myself close to a coronary because I need to try and get all of my responsibilities done in the morning. Now, that's not to say that there isn't some benefit to the office. But I think, you know, what people at work have demonstrated is an incredible adaptability people have said okay i'll come in when there's a reason for me to come in Mm. but if you're just going to do what is the standard form for a lot of people in their jobs back-to-back meetings and emails i can kind of get that done at home Mm. so i think firstly it's demonstrated an incredible versatility of people at work but also i think it's exposed the fact that sometimes bosses were trying to tell us look, you need to accept the hierarchy of the way decisions are made around here. If managers make decisions, you've got to accept them. If everyone else makes decisions, they... and, and I think I love the reverse of it. So look, you know, what I do know, though, that if you look at the best workplace cultures, and this is something that generally doesn't appear a lot in the American literature about it, but really, I think, would be vivid in the experience of most people in Europe, in Australia, in the UK, mm. most people will recognise that good workplace cultures have a sense that we're all in it together. Mm. They have a sense that, you know, there's a, there's a bond, there's an affinity. Now, look, mm. I want to be really clear. You, you can have that bond um, by not being with people every day. In fact, mm. most of us would say the best way I could feel close to my family is not seeing them every <laughs> day. <laughs> True story. <laughs> you know, but, you know the best way that I'm going to enjoy Christmas lunch is not to spend the whole of December with my family. True. Right, okay. So, so, so there's some truth in that, you know. Um, so we don't being close to people in proximity mm. terms doesn't necessarily result in us being close to them emotionally. But I think we're learning. Okay. So now what we know is these two interesting things: the autonomy and the freedom and the flexibility that people have got mm. from working in a different way has been very appealing. And actually, it's been in service of making our whole lives feel more balanced. But um, also we know that the best teams do have a sense that we're all in it together. And I think that's the really interesting challenge. There's something, this, this narrative fallacy is the idea that we believe that we're in the middle of a story. Mm. And, you know, there's a story arc, there's something happening. 
And the mistake we make is thinking we're at the end of the story. Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's yeah, true. Yeah. OK, mm. that's interesting how it's ended up. <laughs> it hasn't <laughs> ended up. Nothing's ended up. Mm. Um, and so, the, you know, the really interesting thing for the recruitment perspective, I think, is firstly, firms haven't necessarily decided where they've ended up. Mm. And secondly, we haven't found a way to articulate our position to to recruits. Because mm. if you think the old days, just to demonstrate, you know, sometimes you, you don't realise you're in a black and white film until you see a flash of red. And he's like, oh, wow. We didn't realise we were in a mono culture of work because no. if, if you applied for a job, very rarely would you ask start time and end time outside of retail, True. outside of bar work. Yeah. Mm. You know, you just presume it'll be around nine to around six. Mm. It wouldn't figure as a big aspect of your discussion. No. It might be like in the final, oh, by the way, it's nine till six. As the final closing note, when someone's telling you what time to get there on Monday, but you know, it's yeah. not. Um, and we wouldn't discuss what days of the week it was, you know, mm. unless there was some reason to say it's not mm. normal days of the week. And you wouldn't discuss where it was going to be done. It's like, that's their office. You would just and assume that, wouldn't you? Yeah. Right. It would be uh, where you went for your interview. That's where you're going to be working. Yeah. You know, there was, there would be no further <laughs> assumption. True. Um, and so you realize we were in a black and white movie. We were in this monoculture that, every, and so if you went on Glassdoor to read what a company was like, you knew, okay, this is the experience of people who did that nine to five, nine to six, five days a week in an office. That's exactly what. Whereas now, for the first time, mm -hmm. these companies have got different agreements on this. Some companies are like, oh, yeah, you can work completely flexibly. Some companies are like, we want you in three days a week. Some companies are like, we haven't fully decided, but the boss is in the state of denial about what's happening right <laughs> yeah. now. So don't rule out more changes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, we're in a in really interesting moment where, firstly, firms haven't fully learned how to articulate it because they, mm -hmm. maybe they haven't decided or there's not words for it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's a really evolving state. So I think it's a fascinating time. Because, you know, I think the one thing we're all really clear on, and, and of course, no, no one would know this better than, um, than recruiters. I think well, one thing that we're really clear on is there seems to be this constant challenge to find candidates, to retain the people that you've got. Yeah. There seems to have been a seismic shift from uh, in terms of how detached people are from their jobs to some extent, mm. that people might be but getting new jobs, but don't feel the five-year affinity that they might have had before. They, yeah, they feel you know, more, more transactional. And so, you know, it, it's really interesting how those things are going to evolve, I think. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And you've definitely summed up where we're at as a, as a recruitment industry. I think, you know, what you've just summed up there, if we're getting into the mindset of a lot of the leaders listening, I have no doubt, they probably don't know what to do for the best. Maybe mm. they personally are looking at productivity, their ROI, and seeing that some people are working well hybrid, some people aren't working so well. So do you then have a split culture where you're getting... And I'm going to be very disingenuous here. Those on their early careers are probably more likely to benefit from osmosis. Being, you know, I've listened to some of your podcasts around this topic where you learn more from people around you or those who have proven that they're just more productive being at home or working from, you know, whichever remote location. So I think that's the problem. There's a dilemma for leaders to make a firm decision. This is what we're going to do because they know that some people, I don't know what the percentage would be, will say, see you later. I'm not doing that. And whichever way they go, and because of what you've just said there, that it's so hard to recruit, attract, retain the best talent. They're, they're really scared of losing some of their best performers. That's the dilemma that they've got. Yeah, here's a theory for you. I think work has transitioned or is in the midst of transition mm. from being something close to our relationship with school to something close to our relationship with college. Mm. And yeah. so what I mean by that is that at school – your the community you were part of was enveloping it was around you it was lesson to lesson it was sort of gossip filled between <laughs> lessons you know you missed a day at school mm. and actually it was like this so intense was the collective feeling that if you mm. missed a day at school you felt like you <laughs> you'd missed, missed out missed, yeah you'd missed an episode of your favorite show you know <laughs> someone threw an apple and it bounced off sir's head you know so these mm. things happened that you just felt like i don't want to miss this um, when you went to college, the, you know, so f f university, the normally, and I'm, you know, I might be sort of not speaking of universal experience, but the people on your course normally weren't the people you spent the weekend with. Mm. They normally weren't your best friends. You might go and have, you know, a coffee with them, a drink with them. But actually, weirdly, 
the accident of the people who are on your corridor or shared a house with you or were friends of your friends were more likely to be your friends. In addition, at school, you had to go somewhere at nine o'clock and you left, at, you know, 3.34 yeah. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you did it. And and that was that was, you know, a register was taken of whether you were attending. At college, you could do your work at midnight well, in your that. bed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it and what determined the result results you get, not where you did it or when you did it, but what you did. Mm. And I think we're moving from one to the other. Now, mm. what does that mean? Well, it's highly likely that our jobs will be less of our identity mm. than they were before. Mm. Because you know, you won't be spending every <laughs> every weeknight socializing with people from work True. you won't necessarily you know one of the interesting things that's happening right now is the best predictor of whether someone likes their job is whether they've got a best friend at work okay that's and, interesting yeah and mm. the indications are people who work hybrid are about a third as likely to say that they've got a best friend at work wow. compared to um the previous work and you know to some extent i suspect we can all see both sides to that number one you might say, you know, having a best friend at work was just a delight. Just having someone you could go and gossip with or yeah. moan to because <laughs> you just had a really miserable, someone had just pulled your legs off in, mm. in the middle of a meeting. You just, you know, you've got the opportunity to sort of unburden mm. yourself. It was actually helpful. Or well, saying after work, you know, should we go and have a drink? It was really helpful. And that's the biggest predictor of whether you feel connected to your job, whether you've got a friend there. And we might be moving to a period where people don't have a best friend at work, a bit like they didn't have a best Mm. friend on their course. Mm. They've got people they chat to, Mm. you know, but that, and so I think we're moving to a a different scenario. It's not necessarily an altogether bad thing, Mm. but it's different things. And certainly Mm. when it comes to team leadership, when it comes to, our connection with work it means that good managers are going to have to be more resourceful about how they make teams feel tightly cohesive how they make teams feel bonded with each other I think you know it's a bigger challenge than it's ever been before I agree with you actually I think it's very very challenging for leaders especially newer leaders you know there's people Mm. that are on their succession plan to first of all embrace all the 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 new role teaches them and and they're trying to learn and still do their their day job but then that like you say have to take into account all these different elements as well as well as those that are actually leading companies I think that that's really insightful and you know you've you've picked up on so many different aspects there and you know you're in a a very advantageous position interviewing some of the amazing guests that you have and if anyone hasn't yet listened to Bruce's podcast you really must go and listen to it it's really insightful so what what other things are the best companies that you're witnessing doing in terms of other aspects like talking around mental well-being diversity and inclusion menopause disability neurodiversity these are all things that recruitment leaders have been talking about much more so since the pandemic it's just you know we talk about broader topics but what's the reality of what you're seeing in the best workplaces yeah, I mean, look, you know, I, I would uh, call BS on most of the talk that companies do on that. And and the reason why I would do that specifically is because I, I think a lot what a lot of companies do is they choose to attach themselves to um, to things, promising solutions on those things rather than make meaningful change. So what is it about a working environment, the modern world of work that's seen the average working day go up by three hours a day in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. What is it about that environment that is making people feel more burnt out than ever before? I don't Mm. know. I've got a pretty good guess um, why people might be burnt more burnt out because they're working three hours longer than people were Mm. at the millennium. And, you know, but what happens is that rather than address that, rather than say people are working too hard here and specifically, let's look at it. People are reporting. I was in one organization yesterday. And they said, well, I was talking about meetings and they said the experience of everyone in this organization is they have back to back meetings all day, mm. every day. Mm. I thought, OK, well, what is it about that? That then when you've got burnout um, that you you're surprised by. It. And the, the next thing is, why have you got back to back meetings all day? Yeah. Well, it's largely because there's there's no nothing that prevents people arranging meetings. And people believe that work is done conversationally. Right. They think that work is done in someone talking to someone so it's constant conversation that's what they think work is now um 
and what generally happens then is they say people are burnt out. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a resi- resilient seminar, which is why I've sort of just written this book on this. And, and, you know, firstly, as I say in the book, never in the history of resilience has someone been more resilient by being told to be more resilient. It's very true. But, <laughs> yeah. But um, the, what you generally find is what happened to me when I was t- talking to people about the book, I said, I'm writing a book on resilience and people would sort of freeze and they'd say, Oh my God, I got sent on a resili- resilience course. I say, oh, how was it? And they say, I don't feel any different. Okay. Funnily right. enough. So, yeah. So then I started thinking, okay, who decides what's in those resilient courses? Mm. Whose job is it to, f- well, a little bit of an investigation and you find out, you mm. find out that, you know, the, the resilience literature, the stuff that's peddled to most people comes from really three of three main psychologists and the good news is about psychology in the field of psychology is if you make a claim about something and you claim that you can solve something other people go away and they replicate your work they try and (laughs) they try and duplicate your effort so the good news is uh those psychologists who made the claims made the claims that can fix school kids made the claims that they could fix people in the military uh they they published their work and we're able to see, oh, it doesn't work. It has zero impact whatsoever. Wow. So then you're like, hang on. So a company that isn't changing its working environment from that constant 40 hours of meetings a week, mm-hmm. plus, you know, 200 emails a day or 100 emails a day, plus nonstop Slack messages. And it's sending you on a resilience course. It's actually doing worse than doing nothing. Of course it is. <laughs> because by doing nothing... You got that to deal with. But to send you on a course that's proven not to work is kind of making you go home at the end of the day, they go, is there something wrong with me? No, it's, is, yeah, you, is, you question, is virtue signaling gone very wrong, isn't it? Yeah, it's like, is there something wrong with me that I went on a resilience course and I don't feel any more resilient? I better not tell my <laughs> boss I don't feel more resilient. And so, you know, that's why I became... Mm. Uh, ignited and and so that's the danger i think to some extent that we find ourselves in a situation where um we we hear all these things but they're not mm. meaningful solutions to no. them and you know so here's the thing that i found that my book is actually a very optimistic book but that sounds miserable but um the uh the book is basically resilience is the strength we draw from each other you know mm. resilience you know if you feel resilient it's normally because you feel part of something connected yeah. to other people and supported by them. So, you know, you witness what goes on in Ukraine or you witness the aftermath of an earthquake or a natural disaster. Mm. And you're not witnessing loads of people screaming, I can't handle this. You witness people who seem to have this inner calm, this sort of connection to each other. Like, you know, we feel supported and and uplifted by the people around us. That's what resilience, resilience is the strength we draw from other people. And as soon as you witness that, you think, okay, so how might a company conjure with that and, and deal with resilience which making them workers feel more connected supported you know to some extent in the old days that might have been unionization firms don't want that no. or it might be you know we've got g- groups of people who are going to represent employees versus the company or going to raise because yeah. they don't want that yeah. and so of course what they do is they say oh yeah yeah we're going to do teach this individualistic resilience because mm. it suits the system really so that became my fascination yeah no I can understand that totally and I agree with you there, there seems to be a large narrative around sort of tick box exercise tick box Absolutely. exercises and that's where you know our listener hopefully by you know dropping into this podcast and hopefully listening to yours and many others you you have to learn how to navigate around where the bullshit is and where it's a genuine sort of narrative of what's actually happening you know I mean obviously I'm going to refer to your book now because obviously you've referred to it quite a few times and um I mean I'm only a few chapters in as I've said but I find that uh, there was one bit where you talk about um that quote there no one who's ever been told to calm down has ever calmed down for example you know that's it's the language that we use isn't it very often to ourselves and there's sometimes a tendency where people are you know being dictated to and I'm not saying that's definitely not the case in the recruitment industry but I think certainly for those who hire in newer people and more junior people it's almost like you will do it this way this is the way we've always done it so I, I'm, I'm gonna sort of keep keep reading that and hopefully uh, be able to be able to share that so you know you've also available on audiobook yeah absolutely if you don't want to read you can just listen exactly. to it in fact in fact Shannon who works with myself she produces this show she never reads a book but she listens to books all the time she's an audiobook okay. fan so I personally like a good old-fashioned yeah. piece of paper in my hand I don't even like the older 
electronic Kindle, book, whatever, yeah, yeah, Kindle, yeah. whichever other brands are available. Now, you've been in a very privileged position as um, obviously former VP of Twitter. You, you know, you're an expert and trusted voice across the technology industry. But, you know, what have you found yourself when you've had to go and find presumably very challenging talent pools of people? How have you found it over the years to attract and recruit? Because that's at the moment the biggest headache in the recruitment industry. There's not enough talent out there. So what's been your personal experience as a leader? Yeah, one of the things that, you know, when I used to work at Google, we used to have an interesting philosophy. And you might think, oh, destination employer, you've got like uh, no shortage of candidates knocking on your door. Clever marketing, that is, you know, clever, clever positioning themselves as the best place to work. You know, it's sort of very joined up marketing. But one of the things we set about doing when I was at Google, they had a really interesting nuanced recruitment policy there. You didn't have a budget to hire people. You had a head a head count to hire people. Hmm. What that meant was, you know, uh, Bruce had been given four new roles and I could hire them for any price I wanted. Wow. Okay. And so what used to happen there was people would say, oh, I've got this team. I'm going to hire a former managing director to run that team. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what you end up with then as a result like that you end up with loads of really senior people, like hundreds of them. You go to a meet and there's just dozens of senior people and no one doing the job. Mm. No one feeling like they want to do the job. And so I used to, when I was setting up YouTube, I was given, you know, initially three, then seven, then, uh, then 19, then 40. Then, you know, I was given these people and I used to hire Kids, I mean, like at Google at the time, you could only get in if you'd got a degree. They have changed that since, and I do mm. think that's toxic. Mm. But um, you could only get in if you got a degree. So I just used to hire, you know, kids who just graduated. Yeah. And these genuinely just kids who graduated. Mm. And the enthusiasm they'd have. The, so that was our, the way we made our talent, because we knew if I can get these people for two years, I know I can get them working the way I want them. Yeah. Whereas if I try and find the very you know, I'm never going to get someone who's perfectly matched to what we were doing. And so people used to look at me. We used to have pop music playing. I don't, <laughs> you know, I, I, we had music playing with the only team that had music playing. We had like young, enthusiastic kids who were just like really eager to get on. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't all exactly young. You know, there's some people who just at, at later in their career wanted to jump. But um but, you know, and so that's what we did because we wanted to try and create a sort of sense that things were different. When I was at Twitter, uh, we were less of a destination, you know, still in mm. technology. You see, mm. superficially think it's appealing. And the interesting thing about Twitter is that we, because we didn't just want people who used Twitter, a lot of people, half the people you meet don't use Twitter. Mm. And we didn't want to just hire people who use Twitter. Mm. So, you know, our view was, well, people who don't use it, actually, they're as interesting for Ag us. Agreed, totally, yes. Yeah. How can we understand why they didn't use it and how can mm. we overcome? So that was so like, you know, a whole load of people we hired who weren't big users of Twitter. Mm. And uh, but we um, but our view was, OK, we want people to uh, when you work here, we want people to in whatever job they were doing we want people to say that was my favorite meeting of the week now that's you know so that might be they're going to meet the bbc to get a hashtag on the screen or they're going to meet a, a car company to sort of get them to advertise or you know someone going to meet a footballer but we wanted it to be their favorite meeting of the week now that's not to say we were just hiring performers but you know we had a real focus on making sure that every time the team went out, they would take brand new stuff out. So the, our intention was, if you saw a presentation by Twitter at Tuesday morning, there were tweets in it from Monday night. Wow. That was, and so we had- Fresh. Like, yeah, so we had- <laughs> we, So you know, if you went out and it was the Brit Awards on Wednesday and you were presenting on Thursday, you would open with four minutes of tweets about the Brit Awards. Wow, like, gosh. And, you know, so we, we set the team up to do that. So, you know, there was someone who- mm -hmm constantly did that it, like people would always say the twitter presentations are beautiful like we had someone who was focused on making them look beautiful because my view was okay we might not be the best most appealing thing they'll see today you know like i say half people didn't use twitter mm. but i want people to look at it going wow they tell that story really well yeah. and so you know and so to some extent we were looking for someone who'd 
who'd focus on that. You know, I, I've got a soft spot for people who try and do inventive things, largely because I got my first job by sending a cartoon CV. Oh, great. To, yeah, through to record companies and, and, to, um, and to jobs wanted. And eventually, even though I ended up doing loads of work experience at record companies, and um, even though I didn't get a job from it, it was in the midst of a, a recession, I ended up using that same CV to get a job at Capital Radio. That's how I got my first wow. job. Wow, amazing. And, That's uh, it. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I've got a big soft spot for anyone who uh, communicates in creative ways. So, you know, we'd have people who, when I was at YouTube, someone created, I think it's still on YouTube, it's called CVIV. And it's uh, someone created a video using uh, YouTube annotations. So he said, if you want to see about my personal life, click, click here. If you want to see about, brilliant. If wow. you see it, yeah. if you search on YouTube for CVIV, Okay. You know, see, it's not it's not the best, it's not the perfect, most perfect done, but it's really nice. And so I met with and him. And it's different as well. Yeah, it's gonna right. make them stand out, isn't it? That's right. We had a couple of people who did similar things at Twitter. Uh and I just love things like that because yeah. you know it just shows that you're thinking about your audience. What I always say to candidates, when if I go into schools, I always say, look, you know, um, if someone told you there was a uh a a way to get to someone that like no one else uses. If someone told you there was a lane on the motorway that no cars drive in, yeah. you go, all right, unbelievable. Okay. I think I'll drive in that lane. But <laughs> posting something to someone is that now mm. most people at work get zero letters a year. Yeah. Mm. You know, they get no mail, they, they get a magazine subscription, you know, and especially because we went through two years without seeing our offices probably most of those have been moved to home so now if you've got the chance if you're a candidate to send something to someone and no it will be the only thing that sits that on their yeah i find it true. unbelievable i yeah. said to kids at school if you want to if you want to go and work at whatever company it is i guarantee you could you could get your message to the boss of that now in my experience if you make it a little bit emotionally involving if you make it look charming you know personally if i was doing it i would send a balloon attack with a polaroid attached of me holding a cup of tea saying i'll make you a cup of tea if i was a kid trying <laughs> to get it. work experience oh sorry a kid trying to get work experience Ooh. forget about asking your mum and dad for help you know like demonstrate that you've done something yourself anyway I love that. Like Great that, um, ideas, though. You get you yeah. get to be bombarded with balloons and cups of tea offers now, Bruce. Unfortunately, I <laughs> unfortunately I yeah well, unfortunately I don't have any jobs to offer. But what I mean yeah. is that um, but what I mean is uh, if you were like trying to get work experience somewhere mm. and sending a a Polaroid to someone saying you know I will make you a cup of tea four times yeah, a day. It's, it's just it's just being it's being a bit brave, bit brazen, but just being creative and original. Yeah, and I think absolutely. maybe the world was lacking that because of the Instagram kind of veneer that the the last generation have certainly lived through. I think to actually stand up and be different and like you say, just send something in the post. Yeah. Send send some brownies, you know, send something that makes the person stop and think. I think it's really, really good advice actually. Really interesting. First ruling advice. radio. First of all, I used to work in radio. Obviously, I got my job at Capital Radio with the cartoon. First rule in radio, you never eat anything that's been sent to you. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. So, yeah. Oh, right. You okay. Eat, you never eat something that's come from a listener. Okay. So, just, uh, just in case. Oh, gosh. I don't no, I personally think about wouldn't that. send brownies. No. But, um, okay. But maybe yes, not. It's just because I like brownies. You can also make brownies. Yeah. Stuff. Now, I want, to just, <laughs> I want to just ask you something before, because I know you've given up so much of your time and I've been, I've been so grateful to you. Um. A large part of what happens in recruitment is when the, the we're talking about culture changing. Obviously, we are definitely in a transition. We're definitely not in a new norm because I don't know what that even means. So when you've got a culture that has gone, is going through a change at the moment, and as a leader, we're looking around going, right, well, you know, they're just not really part of it anymore, but they've been a super biller. They've been, you know, a really big part of our talent pool. What would you do as a leader if you can see that there's basically toxicity in the business that wasn't there before, should people be thinking about performance managing on behavior on that basis, if they're not going to be part of our new journey? Yeah. I mean, look, firstly, it demonstrates the importance of, of cultural catalysts in the team. If you've got mm. someone in the team, that's like a, one of those radiators that everyone loves being part of that loves yeah. that loves, you know, that energize and motivate and, and make the team laugh you know, bite that, bite your hand off to, to keep them. You know, those, mm. 
cultural magnets are going to be worth their weight in gold, the, the, the value they're going to bring. And mm. I think, you know, it's an important reminder to understand that curating team culture is going to require you understanding what, you know, what elevates something. And look, the way you might think about this, if you were having a party, you think about the music, you think about the staging, you think about the dress code, you think about the food, because you know, if you just bring people into a room without some sort of curated experience, it might be quite flat. Yeah. You know, look, what's the difference between people turning up to, you know, a, a school meeting for parents and a party, you know, the signals you send about the energy. And so I think it means for leaders, you need to think about how, what you're doing to build that energy, that connection, that that buy-in. What would people perceive as a reason to believe that we're all in this together? What would they, what would they imagine as the reason why they care about this? Um, mm. So those things are really critical. These, uh, there is really interesting evidence about um, people who can poison the water. The the, the water. Um, you know, there was a really interesting piece of work done, I think, in Australia, where they had groups of people, people working on a project, and they deliberately brought brought in someone who was like a secret agent, right. someone who was going to uh, create a toxic environment. So one of the people they brought in had their heads down in their hands, saying, "What's the point of all this?" Someone said, "This is so boring," and had their feet on the table. <laughs> and like one of these secret agents was brought into each team. And what they found was that one disruptive person could more than, uh, I think, could reduce the performance of a team by o- almost half. Oh, uh, my gosh. Massive. Wow. So, look, you know, so what does it tell us? Drains and radiators have a disproportionate impact mm. on the way we're working mm. and the, the, the impact on our culture. And so, yeah, absolutely. You might say, OK, I'm going to think specifically about the way that this person is having an impact you know normally with performance issues you split them into conduct and capability and you know so is this is someone at high high capability but their conduct is bad then mm. i think you know calling out their conduct is a really vital part of, of leadership mm. and you know may, and there's opportunities to do that definitely if you feel that it's impacting other team members so conduct and capability and i think probably you know those things have always been the the axis that you need to think about for performance but if someone is negatively impacting the overall um engagement of a team then that's a really vital consideration i think no we talk without shadow we don't want any mood heavers we i like the radiate the radiate versus you know, the sort mm. of, I, I like to think that well, that's what we should be doing anyway because of the job that we're doing. Oh, that's been really, really insightful. So what's next for you, Bruce? Because I, obviously I'm a super fan of yours. Talk to me about people that are inspiring you right now and then what's next for you. Are, are there any more books up your sleeve? I don't think I'll write another book, certainly not in the short term. Um, look, you know, delighted that the book's just hit the bestsellers. So um, I'm thrilled about that. Um, you know, um, yeah, thank you. Um, um, going out and talking about that, I've been been out somewhere this morning I was out somewhere yesterday I'm at an event all day tomorrow right. talking about so you know I'm out sort of talking about that and and having an impact um and some lovely reviews coming in last week uh Ed Miliband called it an an absolute revelation I've had some Amazing. really nice comments from uh from sort of other endorsements so thrilled about that you'll see on the top there that Stephen Bartlett from Diary of his CEO gave it a lovely uh blurb too so you know some really nice comments just talking about that really i think <laughs> i think in ter- anyone who's got a job right now is in a really fascinating moment of work because mm-hmm. the idea that we're going to create something that's future facing and progressive and new by trying to go back to the way that things used to be isn't going to work and yeah. so you know it's going to require all our inventiveness to say what can we do that's going to make this different and special mm-hmm. it's why I um I often talk about sort of you know some of the pillars of workplace culture. Um one of those pillars, you know, so the pillars for me are the importance of voice, people feel heard, they feel that their their voice matters, the importance of affiliation, a strong connection between people is a vital component of work. There needs to be space, there needs to be slack in the system. Uh, you know, normally a good culture isn't one where people are so burnt out they can't do anything. True. I went to one, I went to one company 
and they said, uh, we've tried to change the culture here. We invited everyone to a four hour uh, se seminar about it and no one came. I thought too right they didn't. And then, the, yeah and then the final uh, part is articulation talking about mm -hmm. culture you know good cultures talk about their culture and especially in this era where we spend less time together mm -hmm. talking about your culture and trying to understand how you transfer that culture to the next generation of recruits if mm -hmm. you've got something someone coming to work for you how do you talk about your culture in an honest meaningful and mm -hmm. and transferable way i think that's you know one of the big challenges for anyone right now it definitely is and it, you know it's it's like any relationship isn't it you wouldn't just have a marriage that you don't talk about how you're feeling about things and it's the same in any meaningful relationship which work definitely is oh my gosh there are so many amazing sound bites in this Bruce I can't believe you came on uh, I'm truly grateful to you and um, I, I just want to thank you for everything that you do because I have been listening and there are so many wonderful episodes that I think our audience would definitely benefit from listening to and you know I'll continue to listen and I can't wait to get to the end of the book I'll let you know what I think but thank you so much thank for joining so us. Much. I really so appreciate it. You. you too, too. Take care. Thank you.